I think the first thing we have to define is what does it mean to come into the light? Because some of us have brought our sin into the light in, in, in church or with a friend or, or on the phone call because we couldn't stand the pain any longer. And so we spill our, our guts to a friend or someone, and then we are hurt further because that friend didn't have the emotional or spiritual capacity to take That's our so good and handle it with care. So you ha- I love the scripture that tells us to confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Mm-hmm. It says one to another. It doesn't say to everyone. Right. That's so, so good. Now, but, but having said this, so that takes discernment. But having said that, you can tell God everything. You, yeah. can, you can stand naked before the Lord. And I think that's something I didn't know how to do, Brenda, for a really long time. Hello, friends. I'm Brenda Crouch. I believe the winds of global change compel us to the mysteries that speak to path and purpose. In a time of amplified chaos, there is a divine compass to navigate the conditions that drive our everyday decisions. For the next 30 minutes, we'll explore stories and the knowledge of sojourners who will point the way to the secrets that lie before us. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here today. You know, so many of us can identify with um, wanting to uh, pursue our dreams and our goals with the best of intentions. But what happens when the best of our intentions are not good enough? What happens when we find failure, when we find disappointment with ourselves? What happens to those of us who call ourselves Christ followers hit that place of failure and desperation. Well, I believe that's a place of a new beginning. I believe that's where life actually begins. And my guest today is an amazing person who has got such a deep well within her of life to give to you. And so I want you to just stay where you are and hold on because Michelle Pilar is a writer and author, a sought after speaker, taking her innovative The Close Line live events to audiences around the country. She got her start at just 19 years old as a Christian contemporary music artist, becoming a three-time Grammy nominee. She's worked with Billy Graham Association. She's performed for royalty and lent her voice to the animated hit show, The Simpsons. And you might have seen her more recently on The Dr. Phil Show. She makes her home in rural Leapers Fork, Tennessee, alongside her husband, Matt. But you know what? I like to, uh, I want you to know that this is a friend of mine and I look up to her so much in so many ways. And so Michelle, I just want to welcome you and thank you for honoring us with your time today. Oh, Brenda, I am so happy to be with you and thankful to be with you. And, you know, we are friends. And so I I hope today we can talk as friends so that everyone listening. He knows that we're just girls. We're just women that have yes. stumbled and fallen, and Jesus has done so much for us. So there's nothing, to hide, nothing to hide. Amen. To. Yes, <laughs> nothing to hide. And, you know, I think that's what I love about you so much. When we met uh, a few years ago, I instantly connected with your spirit and with uh, that, you know, that place that you love Jesus from, it's the same place I love him from. And so we have so much in common in those those areas. And when I read your book, I discovered we had a few other things in common, like that we like salty food. I would, I would go for that before the sugary things and the sweet. And, uh, you know, I also, I don't know if you know this, but I I may have told you at what some point, but I also was a singer from the age of two years old, growing up singing with my family and ministering in churches and different venues. So, you know, my heart um, and my wheelhouse for music, music has spoken to me intrinsically over the years. And at one point, my whole identity was really wrapped up in that. And I remember um, I was in Bible college in the mid eighties. And I was a, I listened to your music all the time. I loved your music. And I remember being able to see you in concert. In, uh, it was in uh, central California in Sa- Sacramento. And I was just so impacted by your music, but you know, to be able to hear your story and to see how your music really kind of resonated with your journey and to hear your story and what you suffered from, even as a child, um, the things that really set you up for 
not knowing how to navigate all the landmines that come and the wiles of the enemy, so to speak. Um, I really feel like your, your journey speaks so deeply now. There's God's going to, God is doing more with your story now than he ever did in the past. And that's because of the authentic uh, journey. Wouldn't you think? Absolutely. I mean, of course, when we come to know Jesus, we want to be, we instinctually want to be a great representative of the love we feel in our hearts. We know we've had an encounter with the living God. Nobody yeah. had, it was not something we signed up for like Amway, you know, right? And knowing Jesus is a personal encounter, just like when he walked the earth, he opens our eyes and says, I'm real. I love you. I am yeah. God. And I can live inside of you. So we know that's real. But what I didn't know was that the process of being restored in Christ was going to take me an entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Salvation. That's so good. You know, salvation. I still remember my first prayer, Brenda, sitting on my little bed at my mom's house, 17 years old. And I said, Jesus, come into my heart and do whatever it is you do when you get there. (laughs) That was my. And, you know. He doesn't care about our words. He cares about what we're asking for. He Mm -hmm. cares about our sincerity before him. Show me how to do this. And so he did. He came into my heart. But then it got tricky because I was lifted up in front of the public with these baby spiritual legs. Mm -hmm. And I was only 19 Mm -hmm. when I was signed to a record label. So, And I loved Jesus. I couldn't have loved Jesus more than I did. But I was so broken. I was still so broken mm-hmm. from growing up in a home of alcohol and growing up in a home of, you know, not, not having a Christian upbringing. I, I didn't have any spiritual roots. So there was a lot of brokenness that was uh, just right there. And Jesus wanted to heal it. But when yeah. I was, while I was trying to be a great representative of him, the truth be told, I didn't even know how to let him into that brokenness. I was just trying to look like a good Christian because I thought that would glorify yeah. Him. And like you just said, what I have since figured out now here, I'm 66, I figured out that it, it's through the brokenness and the failing. I mean, I had to fail because I couldn't mm-hmm. stand in my own righteousness. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Nobody can. And so God in his great mercy, he allowed me to fail. And then, and then true desperate restoration began to take place. And yes. That, that's what people see. They they don't yeah. see Jesus in our pretending or our, not we're pretending in our trying to be perfect. They see Jesus in um in in our desperation to have more in our humble need for Him mm-hmm. and and in our flaws. There, that's that's where people yes. See Jesus. Oh, you're speaking my language. And that because I had a very similar experience with him and loved him so much. I wanted to glorify the Lord, but it was in, you know, my own process of failure and unraveling. And, you know, this, there's a scripture that um, I think is so beautiful that depicts what we're talking about. And it's in second Corinthians 318. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. So going back to the beginning of that, it says with unveiled face. So it's the place where we take the mask off and where we get honest absolutely, and where we decide, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to step into the light. That was probably one of the biggest epiphanies for me was, uh, you know, for myself and then walking with my own father through his death at the end of his life and some of the secrets Mm. To be able to, you know, mourn the fact that he never could step into the light because of the depth of shame. And I think so many people are tied to their shame or their addiction or whatever it is, and they they don't understand the importance of this. There's a place in your book <clears throat> where I want to go here because I want you to speak to this. Okay. I, I just think that we all as humans have a propensity to run from our pain, but by in doing so, we we end up burying it alive, and that gives power to our pain, and we can't be free. But there's a place in your book, in um, in the chapter called Found, and you say, God's voice chimed in loud and clear. It's time to heal, Michelle. 
But first, it all has to come into the light. Tell the truth. It's time to tell me everything, Michelle, and then tell the world. My tears fell like, fell like rain as this epiphany filled my heart and mind. You, Lord, are the truth, and I never again want to be afraid to tell you everything. You trump all my truths, my secrets, my shame, my knots, and I exhaled. And then skipping over just another page, you say, the foe is silence. So I speak to individuals, to groups, to a broken world, and I tell the truth, everything, especially that, Je that Jesus is obedient, sacrificial act is greater than any act or deed I have ever done greater than what any of us has ever done. And so I'd like for you to speak to that where people feel like, you know, that's that's great for somebody else's uh, sin, for somebody else's failure, but mine is so deep that, and there's so much shame and condemnation attached to it, I could never step into the light and be honest with God or with anyone. And that breaks us. It breaks our fellowship uh, with ourselves and with God, and with our fellow man. Can you speak to that place where people are stuck? Yeah, I think when I hear you describe all that so beautifully, Brenda, I, I see a person that's um, being held hostage by their mm -hmm. secret. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the first thing we have to define is what does it mean to come into the light? Because some of us have brought our sin into the light in, in, in church or with a friend or or on the phone call because we couldn't stand mm -hmm. the pain any longer. And so we spill our, our guts to a friend or someone, and then we are hurt further because that friend didn't have the emotional or spiritual capacity to take That's our so good and handle it with care. So you have, I love the scripture that tells us to confess your sins one to another that you might be mm -hmm. healed. It says one to another. It doesn't say to everyone. Right. That's so, so good. Now, but but having said this, so that takes discernment. But having said that, you can tell God everything. You yeah. can you can stand naked before the Lord, and I think that's something I didn't know how to do, Brenda, for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And and interestingly, when you're talking about that chapter you just read from, the sin that you're that I'm referring to in that chapter is that I had I had had an abortion when I was 17 mm -hmm. years old, three mm -hmm. weeks. I came to know the Lord Jesus. My breaking point of perfectionism was becoming yeah. pregnant by, from a man who was eight years my senior and having him take off and didn't want to tell my mother, disappoint mm -hmm. her, found myself in an abortion clinic um, about three months after Roe versus Wade passed. And wow. they promised me the world at that abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. They promised me freedom. They promised me that I didn't have to, they wouldn't hurt me. Promised me I didn't have to tell my mother even though I was a minor, they made me all kinds of promises, none of which turned out to be true as time went on. I was, I never had children again. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I needed my mother at that time. I mean, everything about that was just one lie after the other, but I held that secret in my heart. Three weeks later, when I asked Jesus to be my savior, Brenda, I asked mm -hmm. him to be my savior, but I didn't know how to give him my abortion. I thought he died mm -hmm. for everything somehow in my young, immature, spiritually yeah. immature. I thought he died for everything but my abortion. So what did I do? Like you said, I buried it alive. Then yeah. I began to be in the ministry, singing with Billy Graham and all. And it's funny because when you're being held hostage by a secret, the enemy waits until at the perfect opportunity when you need to feel strong. Like when I needed to step foot on the Billy Graham crusade stage in front of 40,000 people, that's when the enemy would point at me. He would wait till mm. that moment. Yeah. And then yeah. he would say, you don't deserve to, if they only knew. And so this is how this hostage situation plays out. And so it wasn't until I was almost um, 45 years old or however old that the Lord finally got a hold of that secret and said, Michelle, mm -hmm. and he did it through a dream. But the point mm -hmm. is, um, I, I, I knew that it was time to heal from that. And I realized then that I'd held on to that all those years and decades. Mm -hmm. And and the Lord had healed my baby from the minute he left my body. Mm -hmm. And the Lord showed me that. But now he said, now it is time for you to heal. And that was the part you were just reading in the chapter. Yes. So I say all that 
because I think people have to get good and practice at sitting before the Lord. It's a skill yeah. that takes time. You sit quiet. You carve out that time with the Lord mm. whenever, whenever you can in the morning, or maybe for some it's at night, whatever. I like to do it in the morning, but I, I sit and I actually make a list of, wow. I say, Lord, shed, shed your light on what's going on in me that I can't even understand. What am I anxious about? Mm. What am I afraid of? What am I holding on to? What am I resentful? Why do I feel small today? Why do I feel like I'm not enough? Because I know you. Yeah. Um, and I, may, I start writing. And then I come before the Lord and I give him my my list. I, I said it before him. And I say, now, Lord, speak to me. And, and I open his word and I start to find verses that are the antithesis of what's on my list. The Lord begins to teach you how to sit with him and let him touch these things with prayer, with his word, with him speaking into your heart. And as you do, he begins to restore you. I don't think a lot of people actually even know how to do that. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And I think that it's it's really tragic that especially in the Western world, you know, the Western church has been, we've been so shaped and uh, impacted by perhaps maybe the the media and the celebrity um, image that has come with uh, being a Christ follower in in the <laughs> you know it, it's all good it's all good to have ministries and media and Christian music and all these things but what we've done is we've kind of dumbed down and we've we lack in the areas of studying the scriptures and letting those scriptures, feed us as they come alive through the spirit that, you know, his living, breathing word. And I think we've gotten so, and we've fallen so in love with Christian culture. We've lost our love for Christ and we're confused about what that even looks like. And, and I don't mean that as, as a slam to the industry to listen, my husband and I work in media, but I think we really, the, the world is shaking right now and it's shaking because God's hand is shaking it. That's and right. I believe that this is an opportunity that we have right now as it shakes and we feel the pressures uh, during the last couple of years with a pandemic and how that has thrown us into the absolute uh, frenzy of, you know, how do I how do I find my bearings and 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 feel grounded and and there's nothing that feels secure or sure and uh, you know politically uh, religiously uh, all institutions are shaking and our systems are falling apart. So I see this actually as a positive thing because it now is awakening some of the people are hurting. It's awakening some of those um, anxieties and resurfacing things that people have long buried alive. And they've been coping. We're really good in our culture about coping with things. And, you know, we, we find ways to project a lie that is really a counterfeit. So here we are with this opportunity to discover the real truth, the real deal. And um, I think that in... I'd like for you to speak to ministries that perhaps are are running on empty, you know, ministers who yeah. are, you know, their 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 own lives, their own families are falling apart. Paul and I have have seen this tragedy over and over and it's it's so sad. What's and the ambition that's driving us? We're getting tapped out. I I think I think when I again when I hear you describe what you just did it's the difference between being a spectator and and the, the difference between you know just being standing on the outside and kind of you know being a spectator like watching a good movie and then walking out of the theater i mean yeah and and a good. real intimate and intimate relationship with jesus and mm -hmm. let me let me paint a scenario okay it's it's so easy to when i'm making dinner you know to tell what's her name over here that i want to hear a certain <laughs> song <laughs> yeah. And and then I put on that music and I'm cooking dinner and then I go to church on Sunday and I enjoy that and I and th that is all good. We the problem is we have a wealth of input, you know, Christian input all around us. Mm -hmm. We pop mm -hmm. us, you know, listen, a great CD or we listen to a great Christian radio station in our car. If we're not careful, 
it, it's all coming from the outside like that. And I, I think that we rob ourselves, like you're saying, of really having an intimacy with Christ. Yes. Um, because that stuff is good and it makes you feel good. It fills you up. It can have, it can be filled with God's truth. It can recalibrate you and encourage you, but nobody can touch and heal you and restore you and meet your need. Like Jesus can, whatever Jesus personally touches, it's changed forever. And if you look at scripture, that's what happened to everybody in the new Testament that ran into him one way or the other, mm -hmm. they were changed because it was a personal yeah. encounter. So I, I think for the, the the person that's tapped out, I've been tapped out before. My book is a story mm -hmm. of it. Um, mm -hmm. I took my eye off the the ball. I I, mm -hmm. I was getting it from outside. I was giving way more than I was sitting at the Lord. I just I lost my balance in an intimate yeah. relationship with Jesus. And and as soon as you do that, you are going to be afraid. You you're going to feel like everything's shaking because it's all. None of that stuff is Jesus. It's it should glorify mm -hmm. Jesus. It's not the real Jesus. It's just um, the ministry of Jesus is great, but it's not Him. Yeah, yeah, I exactly. It sounds kind of harsh, but I hope it doesn't sound. But it's harsh. But, but it's the truth. It doesn't. It doesn't sound harsh. It sounds like um, you know actually. God's mercy is is the thing that's shaking us. He wants us to know this freedom and this intimacy. And I think we can't get there until we actually come to that place of realization that, you know what, I can't do this on my own. I think that ambition is great. It's a ambition is a wonderful thing. It, it it's uh it's been the inventor of, you know, many wonderful things on the earth, but if our ambition is rooted in our need for identity, in our need, in our ego, um, so to speak, and we bring that to the platform of ministry, uh, it's a performance and, it, and we don't really, we there's a disconnect. And so I think that it's our gift when we, you know, you call it uh, coming untangled. I called mine being un unraveled. And yeah. uh, it, I think that that was my gift. It was your gift to be able to come to the, person of Christ and say, I'm done. I'm done with the way I've been doing this. I can't do it. Lord, I need your help. And, you know, I think of Peter, how he was so ambitious and he was so uh, in love with Jesus. I mean, we could relate to that. He was the guy that was, you know, chopping the ear off of the soldier just hours <laughs> before the crucifixion, you know, the guy that stepped out on the water and all these amazing things that Peter did. And yet in those final hours, he had to come to that place, that crossroads where he had denied him. Imagine how he felt in that place. And I think, you know, this is the place that Jesus prophetically said, you know, your name is Peter, Simon. And upon this rock, I will build my church. I believe that it's upon the rock of that revelation that I can't do it. Mm -hmm. But with you, Christ, I can do all things because you strengthen me. And that's got to take, that requires that intimate relationship where we're inviting him into the things we don't want to look at. No. The, the things we're afraid to. And that's why I, I kind of, you know, went to that place of, you know, we can't bury things alive and, and be in denial trying to do good. But it's really about acknowledging those painful things and, uh, you know, we're bringing them to him. What, go ahead and Well, I was, I was going to add in that I think it's frightening for people because they think that it's going to take as long to heal as it did to get hurt. And, and yeah. because they have no idea on how to heal this massive wound that now is, mm -hmm. is ancient and it's, mm -hmm. and it has a way they, they're afraid to open that can of worms because it, it will hurt more or it will take too long to heal. And that's just not true. Um, yeah. It doesn't take the Lord nearly any time, really. And, and, and it's not instantaneous, but again, his, his living word, his love, his healing, his even understanding, like he did with you, you wrote about it in your book, coming to a place of understanding of how those wounds happened, having the mm -hmm. Lord just give you understanding can heal you. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so much he can do, and he does it pretty quickly once you open up. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the enemy would rather that you just keep it buried. Um, because right. then you're a slave to it and you don't, you don't live to your full potential. 
So that's um, so true. I think that instant thing that I felt so powerfully was the relief and the 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 pressure coming off and that burden be that's on Christ. God never intended for us to carry that that kind of a burden. Right. And yet the journey has been a process, a process of healing, a process of epiphanies, revelation, and that comes through that intimate walk with him where mm-hmm. there is no condemnation and you walk in a different kind of freedom to experience that is to you know to come to the table and to taste and to see that the Lord is good. Yes. And it, man, that's like a whole new paradigm for the dynamic of relationship. Wouldn't you agree with that? Uh, with Absolutely. Him? You know, Brenda, you know, I do the clothesline conference and people say, well, yes. why, do you, why do you bring a clothesline on the plane, a full scale clothesline, hang it up and put garments up? And I, I tell them it's because I, 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 it's such a clear visual of the garments I picked up along the way that somebody else gave me something they said, like I hang the garment of shame, which is actually mm-hmm. my mother's triple X granny panties. Um, I mean, I take this huge <laughs> underwear and, and I put the word shame on it. And I talk about hanging those panties on the line in Orange County when I was a kid and the whole neighborhood could, could see our line. So, I mean, I was ashamed. Now I wasn't ashamed because oh. she was big. I, that what my point of shame wasn't that my mother was large. My point of shame was the fact that I thought the whole neighborhood knew why she was big and she was big because she wow. drank, too much. she drank too much and she wow. didn't. Eat. And I was all of a sudden I took upon my mother's shame. I started wearing her shame and it wasn't until yeah. I'd known the Lord a long time that he, he told me, he said, Michelle, you get up every morning and you put on shame. So during the clothesline, we look at these garments and then we trade them in. We look at God's word and then we trade them in. We we shed them and we, we toss them and we take on the garments that the Lord would have us wear. I mean, power and peace mm-hmm. and forgiveness and appointments and purposes and beauty. And he, he gives us these powerful garments, but we can't wear them both. We have to shed the old before we can take on the new. Amen. Amen. I think, uh, you know, understanding that the process is where the beauty lies. You know, we're so destination oriented, you know, we're we're looking at the brass ring and God is more interested in the journey. That's, that's where he is. And, you know, that's where his work is being done. He's more interested in that than, than our end goal. And uh, I, I think just by letting go of the end goal and saying, I want to live this life authentically. I want to enjoy my next breath. I want to be present in the moment. And I want to know you here is where it starts, you know, and just that's an that's an honest and vulnerable place. Um, but, but you know what, Brenda, yeah. when when you really love somebody and when you are in love with somebody, you want to take a walk and you don't even care where yeah. you're You don't care True. the destination. You, you just want to walk with them. You want to yeah. listen to each other. You, you mm. want to be together. And, and yes. when, God, when God is beckoning your listeners, you know, right now and saying, please, please let me have that. It, it's not a homework assignment. That's so good. You know, it's not. That is so good. It's, it's not a say that. You know, it's it's not something you're going to check off your list as a Christian to do list. I'm going to read. I'm going to sit with God, and then I'm. Gonna... He's actually saying, "I love you," and just like you have fallen in love with different people in your life, he says, "That's a microcosm. I I want to fall in love with you that way, and I can't yeah. do it if we don't walk together. We don't talk together. He his whole goal is he wants to know us, and he mm-hmm. my sheep hear my voice, and he says, that "I know them." And they follow me. What I, I used to misread that and say, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Uh-uh, it doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. My sheep hear my voice and Jesus said, and I know them and they yeah. follow me. We know God. We say we know God. Does he know me? Yeah. Does he mm-hmm. know me? Or do, mm-hmm. or do I just kind of know him sort of by mm-hmm. what I've read and how I've read? The idea of him. <laughs> yeah. He wants yeah. to know us. He wants to love you. He wants to mm. sit, walk with you, and talk. He wants that. That's why he yeah. died for us to 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 exactly to heal the relationship between a perfect okay. God and a, a you, So you struggled with your father 
with your re- relationship with your father, I had struggles with mine that um, I, you know, kind of late in life came to understand. Uh, and I had to, I was in love with the image of my father for so many years and he was my hero, but I had to come to the truth of some things and I still adore and love my father. That's, you know, I'm very healed in that area, but I think that this can cause with, with women, especially, or men who have struggled with that relationship with their earthly father, it can cause a disconnect with their concept of who their father God is. Absolutely. And so h- help us to yeah. know what those baby yeah. steps look like of yeah. communi- communing with him and walking with him. How did he do that when they couldn't do it with their own? Right. Great question. The last garment I hang on at the end of the day of the clothesline conference is a man's big plaid shirt. And I hang it up and I wrap the arms around me and I stand with those arms wrapped around me looking at the wow. women. I say, I'd like to introduce you to someone you may not know. His name is Abba. Mm-hmm. And and the thing is, is I, I tell the women, I spent years knowing two thirds of the Godhead. I knew Jesus, the Savior. I could relate yeah. to him. I knew the Holy Spirit, the chills, the tingles, the guidance, the teachings. The Father was a blank, blank space in my, when I walked into the throne room of God and they said, you know, go to the, the throne room, into the throne room and talk to the Father, I saw a throne that had nobody on it. And yeah. so at a given point, and this only happened mm. say, in the last 15 years, okay, and I've known wow. the Lord since then, I said, Father, I, I, I need to know you. And it, he actually used, again, he used a really rough time I was going through. I'll just be honest, mm. I was going through a divorce. I'd been married almost 30 mm-hmm. years and I was in so much pain. And it was during mm-hmm. that time where I was in so much pain that he, the father swept in and began to show me who he is as my father, my mm-hmm. protector. He's different than Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit. He does different things. They're all three yeah. in one, but the father is different. And when a yes. woman knows who she is to the father or a man, she knows who she is. Before so true. She doesn't know who she is. She mm. can't stand up straight. And so mm. during that time, I, it, I, it's hard to put it into words, but I just sought him as my father. I told him, I talked to him. I want to know you as my father. And he, mm. he began to draw close to me as a father. And again, through the word of God, through sitting with him. Oh my gosh, I, le- I, I learned his fatherhood. I took it as my own. And I realized, just like you said, Brenda, I had no way of knowing before because I didn't have an earthly father. Well, he's completely capable of bridging that gap yes. in that space. And even yes. if you even if you were afraid of your father, or maybe your father abused you, you may really have an aversion to God the Father. God can change that. But you'll have to talk about it and seek him on that. Yeah. Oh, hope- amen. That that's just so beautiful and um I just, I find so much joy in understanding this. And I am continuing to grow in that area with him because it is a process and a journey with him. You know, my friend, I wish we had all day to just sit here and talk about this stuff because this is the rich stuff that people need to know. And um, I love your book. I have so enjoyed it. I love you. I love your heart. You guys have got to get this book. Um, it's called Untangled by Michelle Pilar. Dr. Phil talks about your book with a uh, high, high regard as well. And he read it cover to co- cover also. And he rec- highly recommends this book. So I just want you to know you need to get this book into your hands, into somebody's hands that needs to understand this truth and, and be on the journey Michelle, how can people contact you? Because I think your clothesline tour is a, our clothesline event is amazing. It's such a wonderful concept. Um, you sing, you're just so dynamic and you bring authenticity to everything you do. How can they contact you uh, and get your resources? Probably the easiest way is just michellepillar.com. So it's my name is Michelle with one okay. L. And Pilar has two L's in it. michellepillar.com. Anyone can click. They can peruse the site and hear music, watch videos. They can watch the Dr. Phil interview. And we'll be posting this interview on there. Um, yeah, it's a good way. And there's a contact there. They can write to me. I read those emails myself. 
Um, I, I don't have an assistant read them for me. Um, I read them myself. So I'd love to, uh, I'd love to hear from anyone who'd like to reach out. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I'm going to be in Tennessee pretty soon and I hope I get to see you. We'll have to connect if we can. I'd love to come to your farm and do yes. that someday. <laughs> I just have that in my soul, too. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much, my friend, for being with us today. And um, I really appreciate the fact that your heart is drawn to want to share Jesus and that hope with anybody who's hurting. Thank you, sweetheart. And thank you for all you're doing, all all the people you're reaching and how you're feeding the sheep with beautiful truth. Thank you for your life. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you for your encouragement. I love you too. And friends, I love you. And I sure appreciate you joining us today. I know that your heart was touched. I imagine a few of you are crying right now because you heard words that are coming from a real place of life and hope. And I want you to look her up and follow uh, Michelle Pilar because she's got amazing things to feed you and in your journey. So thanks for being with us today. I invite you again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.